Hey there, welcome to Planet Now, episode two. I want to take a couple of seconds to give a special thank you to the people who are listening to and sharing this thing. And if you're listening to this for the first time, thank you so much for lending your ears. And I hope you feel impressed enough to pass it along. Again, this is Planet Now. I'm Liz, your host. And in episode two, let's take a pause for a minute. We're going to turn things serious here and take you into a conversation with a mother. Brandy Garrett remembers the spring day that the entire family entered a roller coaster. And no, it wasn't the amusement park type. We're not talking about a Six Flags or a Bush Gardens or anything like that. This roller coaster that they stepped onto included a diagnosis and a trek through new terrain for them. Here's part of my conversation with Brandy Garrett of an organization called the Maddie Wagon. It was an unusually warm day in May. I remember this very vividly. And I went to pick Maddie up from the daycare and she was cranky and tired. And, you know, they say, you know, her disposition was very unusual. So we went home and tried to get her to eat. She didn't want to eat. My husband went to give her a bath and he yelled downstairs and asked me, does Madison have an or Audi? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, her stomach, it's really swollen and her belly button seems to be protruding out and looks a little strange. Can you come and check it out? So I did. And, and she's seemed very uncomfortable. So I resorted to getting her comfortable and planned to take her to the pediatrician the next morning, which I did. Um, When we went to pediatrician, the first instinct was perhaps constipation. She's never really had any issues. In fact, she had just had her annual physical a few weeks prior to this. In April, she turned three. So they suggested that we try a couple of things, take her home, And the pediatrician said, but I want you to bring her back this afternoon, regardless of whether what I'm prescribing works or not, I want you to bring her back. I thought it was a little strange at the time, but fast forward, she knew what she was doing. She knew exactly what she was doing by having us come back, which was a definite blessing. So went home and and it actually worked and we went back to the pediatrician. But by the time we got back, Madison couldn't walk. And this is all in one day. And she cried and said her leg hurts. She said, my, my legs are not working, mommy. Can you hold me? And she was burning hot, running a fever. By the time we got back in with the nurse, they took her temperature. It was 104. She couldn't walk. And they used the uh, stethoscope and listened to her belly and told me that they concluded that her appendix was preparing to rupture and that we needed to get her to the emergency room right away. So we went straight to Inova Fairfax Children's Hospital and they did lab work. They did a ultrasound and saw a spot on her abdomen. And I remember them telling me, we see a spot and, and, you know, when you use your hands to indicate where you're talking about, it seems small. I'm like, well, can you take it out? That was my first instinct. Can you take it out? And they're like, well, we need to run a few more tests and see what the universe of this situation is. And so they did um, some CAT scans and, and some other scans. And literally within 24 hours, our lives were changed. And they told us that they suspected it was cancer, that it was neuroblastoma. At the time, I couldn't even pronounce that. We were immediately admitted to the hospital. And that was the beginning of a tumultuous journey, uh, Madison's battle with cancer. She was moved over to the pediatric oncology unit, which I didn't know existed. A lot of ignorance through this process came to light. So we moved over there. They had to do several surgeries immediately. One, to do a biopsy of the tumor in her belly. They had to also install a Broviac, which is a device used for the actual transmission of the chemotherapy. She couldn't get a typical Broviac unit put in because... They suspected it was neuroblastoma, and with that, there's usually very intense treatment where you can't continue to take in and out. So she had a double lumen broviac installed in her chest that stayed in. It stayed in, and it, it did not come out. So it's like tubes hanging out of her chest. And at three years old, you can imagine, can't give her a bath, can't do a lot of things, can't go swimming. We got the results back from the biopsy June 6th, and it was stage four cancer. And not only did she have the tumor in her belly, which is about the size of a small melon, and it was wrapped around major organs and arteries, which is why she experienced the pain in her legs because it was pressed down on, on her on her right side. There was also cancer in her spine, her shoulders, her hips, her uh, bones, and bone marrow. So Brandy tells me they gave Madison a 30% chance to survive. And that immediate treatment was necessary. And it's as if they stepped onto this roller coaster 
and the roller coaster did not even give them a chance to sit down, put on the safety harness, brace their minds. No, honey, it just started moving. Feet barely on, the thing started moving. Those who are dealing with or have dealt with cancer or any other really critical diagnosis, they know that thing has not taken etiquette classes. No one has taught it how to act. The roller coaster just takes off, ready or not. Let's resume Brandy's story about her daughter Madison and the trek the entire family took through this really hard time. So we were diagnosed at Inova Fairfax, but we had to be transferred to Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. because they specialized in the um, research and treatment of neuroblastoma. It's a very rare form of childhood cancer, and you're dealing with solid tumors versus blood. A lot of blood-based cancers have a higher survival rate. There's more research and funding dedicated to those. So when you talk about solid tumors and specifically neuroblastoma, it's very aggressive. It has a high relapse rate. It was a monster. We went into Children's and she got her first cycle of chemo. In all, she got nine cycles of chemo. She also did radiation therapy for a whole month. And because she was so young, she had to be sedated and put to sleep every day for a whole month to make sure she didn't move around during the radiation treatment. We also went to Children's Hospital Philadelphia, CHOP, another institution that specializes in the research and treatment of neuroblastoma. We went there for a very unique radiation therapy and Madison also had a transplant. She did an autologous stem cell transplant. So they harvested her good cells. And then when, after three tries for a transplant, we had no other choice but to proceed. And we did. Unfortunately, the transplant was not successful. So we resorted to a fairly new at the time breakthrough treatment for neuroblastoma called antibody therapy. The way that I describe that is, let's say you're sweeping your floor and you have like, you know, a big mess and you use the broom and dustpan for that, but you got some tiny little dust particles that you can't seem to get up with the broom and the dustpan. So you maybe wet a paper towel and, and blot it. So the idea behind antibody therapy is it deals best with residual disease that has been stubborn to traditional treatment. We did the antibody therapy and she finally went into remission and March of 2014. We also supplemented her traditional treatment with homeopathic treatment as well. We changed her diet to a vegetarian diet. We reduced the amount of dairy that she was taking in, and we gave her natural herbs and medicines that we consulted with a homeopathic doctor to provide for her. So it was quite the roller coaster ride. We thought we were going to lose her several times along the way. But she definitely is a fighter. She was then and she is now. She's an amazing child. She taught us so much, not just about illness and cancer and childhood cancer, but about resilience and faith and optimism and, and light in amidst darkness. So she taught us a great deal and really put a lot of things into perspective for us with how we view challenges and we view life and we, and we think about What's really important? You know, you talk about, you know, your career. Oh, at the time when she got sick, I was working on making it to the top of my organization. And now it's like, I'm just thankful I have a check so I can come home, pay my bills and spend time with my family, which is most important to me. So that in a nutshell is Madison's battle with cancer. So little Madison's battle included several hospital stays and some of them were for multiple days, like 12, 14 day stays. More with Madison's mom, Brandy Garrett. When she received her, her chemotherapy and she got nine cycles of chemo, um, and also I forgot to mention surgeries to, you know, everything from removing the tumor to harvesting the stem cells to, uh, she had to get three different Broviac lines because we had issues with those. She also got a feeding tube uh, because when she went through transplant, she couldn't eat. So the longest hospital stay was about a month and a half for transplant. And then we were pretty much used to the weekly hospital stays for chemo, but there were also some um, emergency admissions that she had for fever or for viruses and different things like that because her system was so compromised. The majority of her treatment was inpatient. She had to be very closely monitored blood pressure and, and different things like that while the chemo was running. But we definitely tried to make the most of it despite that. So try to get really creative with a three-year-old, four-year-old. <laughs> so. And it sounds like you're still making the most of, of that situation, of that experience. When, when did the Maddie Wagon come out? What year was that established? And um, describe a little bit more what you do with the Maddie Wagon. 
During actually one of the hospitalizations that you mentioned about a 12 day stint, an emergency visit, Madison was quarantined. We were stuck there in the hospital. She couldn't leave the room. She couldn't eat. She, she couldn't do anything. And so we were there. So some of Brandy's work colleagues contacted her, wondering what she needed. Brandy says they wanted to do something to help. So she told them, hey, you know, do whatever you feel compelled to do. And she was fine with it. And I'm thinking that maybe do like a fundraiser or, you know, maybe prepare some meals for us or something. But I remember being um, on the phone with them and, and I was telling them about how when Madison couldn't walk, we would wheel her around the hospital in a radio flyer wagon. And I don't know who jokingly said Maddie wagon. And I'm like, yeah, the Maddie wagon, that's what she rides around in in the hospital. And so I remember talking to a couple of different people about, you know, setting something up that was symbolic for her. And I remember, I think I put in a search for Maddie wagon or something. It's kind of foggy how I stumbled upon it, but I put it in and a a website popped up. And so I told my colleague, I was like, you would never believe there's a website out here called the Maddie wagon and they do such and such. And they're like, that's you. You are the Maddie wagon. Madison is the Maddie wagon. That's what we did. We started up a 501c3 nonprofit in Madison's honor. And um, they said our motivation behind this definitely was Madison. We want to help your family. We want to use this as a vehicle, a tool to solicit awareness and also funds for your family to help you with medical bills and things like that. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And so while we were battling Madison's cancer, they had started the organization and literally ran with it. They got banners made. They did fundraisers, car washes. I remember the very first big fundraiser they did was car wash. Madison couldn't be there because she was in the hospital. She had just had the tumor removed. But we were able to like Skype in and, you know, at least she was able to wave to the people at the car wash because they were running around with posters of her and everything. And it was amazing. But um, what ended up happening was towards the end of Madison's treatment, when she was well enough to be out and about in the community, we started to attend the fundraisers and things that were being put on and realized how amazing it was and how important it was to do this work, to spread awareness about childhood cancer and to raise funds, not just for our family, but other families like us. And so we jumped on board the Maddie Wagon actually before Madison went into remission. Now that she's in remission, we basically run the organization ourselves. My colleagues do still help some, but um, my husband and I and Madison and our children take on the majority, the bulk of the work of running the nonprofit because we said, you know, a lot went into making this happen. We don't want it to fade. It's a lamp that needs to stay lit. Now, this reminds me of a song I used to sing as a child. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And that's what they wanted. More with Brandy Garrett of the Maddie Wagon and this light sparked in the middle of a dark experience. And let's hear more about how they're keeping it aflame. We have a couple of annual events that we do, and then we do ad hoc fundraisers here and there throughout the year. But again, our mission, it started out as an organization to just help our family, but it's expanded now that Madison is cancer-free to help other families battling um, pediatric cancer and to really just get the word out there that childhood cancer is real. A lot of people are very, um, it's just not on their radar if they haven't had to deal with it. There's over 15 different types of childhood cancer. People don't realize that. We have our own ribbon. It's the gold ribbon. We say go gold. September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. It's just a lot of these things that you don't really hear about because other cancers have a a larger platform and get more funding. Unfortunately, there's only 4% of uh, federal funding dedicated to childhood cancer research, which is a problem because children are receiving adult medicines for their treatment. And a lot of children end up dying from the side effects of the harsh treatment before they will ever die from the disease itself. So there's a lot of work to be done. We also, and and in that vein, um, we go on Capitol Hill every year and we lobby for additional funding for childhood cancer research, for fairness and equity across state lines, for insurance coverage, because we have to travel outside of our state lines to get specialized treatment for our children. So we go every year, one to two times a year with other organizations that do the same type of work as us and also with Children's National Hospital System. 
and we speak directly with our members of Congress about this. And we assist on a, a, a local, more uh, grassroots level, other families with everything from medical bills to helping them to get gifts for Christmas and whatever you know they may need while, while their children are in treatment. So, One of those annual events is Christmas Maddie Wagons of Hope, which they've been doing every December for the past several years. This year, we are excited to celebrate our fifth annual Maddie Wagons of Hope. The idea behind that is for us to, again, be a light in a time of darkness. Having been in the hospital, been in treatment around the holidays, you understand the burden that it not only has on your family, but just your spirits are kind of low. So we go to uh, Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. every year, usually like the, the Thursday or Friday before the Christmas holiday. And we take not only gifts for the children who are in treatment, but also things that their family may need, such as gift cards to grocery stores, uh, gas stations, Target, Walmart, whatever. And we also take things like really nice blankets for the kids, stuffed animals, pajamas, different things like that for the families. And so what I do is I coordinate with the um, oncology social worker at the hospital a couple of months prior to Christmas, and I try and get an idea of things that they think of the population that they have right now may need. You know, the demographics change every year because we service families with children as young as six months old to children as old as 21 years old, because technically up until the age of 21, you can still be covered under your parents' insurance. And so you're still treated at Children's uh, National. So we have to be mindful of that because a lot of times people just want to give a bunch of toys, which is great. But what we're able to do by not only collecting toys, but also collecting donations is to make sure that we are able to provide things for the other population that we're serving that we may not have receive donations for. So if we get a bunch of toys, we may go out and buy things that, you know, will tailor fit 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds or the adverse newborns, maybe like onesies and zippers and maybe, you know, little infant toys and things like that. So we take the donations and we sift through them and then we have our children go out and buy the remainder of the gifts, pick things that they think other children will like, make them a big part of the service process. And we also take the children with us to the hospital to deliver the toys on that day to to spread a little more cheer. And we also make it a point to donate arts and craft supplies to the art therapy room there. And we provide non-perishable goods to the parents' lounge as things they can come in and just, you know, snack on and eat while they're in the hospital. So we try to think of everything we possibly can when we go up there and take things. It's been a very rewarding event. They look forward to having us every year. As Madison grows older, she's understanding more the importance of what we're doing. And I always make sure and ask her, you know, do you want to do this? Do you understand why we're doing it? You know, why do you want to do it? Because I don't want her to feel forced. Some families, as soon as they're they're freed from this from this beast, they run as far away from it as they can. But we really feel like this is bigger than us, and um, it's our assignment. And so we take it very seriously, and um, we work as hard as we can to fulfill our mission. We're a very small organization, but we try to do really big things with the support of our community. And that's Brandy Garrett of the Maddie Wagon. Brandy's daughter Madison and the entire family, husband, children, all of them were in the fight, even though Madison was the only one physically sick. It was and still is a family thing. And now they run a nonprofit that Brandy's co-worker started to help the family. But now it's a vehicle the Garretts use to help other families who are grappling with pediatric cancers. You can find more information about the Maddie Wagon in the podcast description here and at planetnown.com. Thanks again to listening for Planet Now. We'll be back again next year. Hope you'll join us. Until then, take care.